My dad bought this property back in 1964 and I just fell in love with the place. And my husband and I built our house here. How many people live in an area that was gouged out by a glacier 13,000 years ago and now the salt water fills this trough and the, the tides come and go and the sea life is so abundant and we, we are stewards and if we can only let nature be, we will have this special place for many, 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 many years for our children's children, our animals, and um, I just feel such a joy of being able to be a part of it. The beaches on Puget Sound have been forming over thousands of years. Waves erode the shoreline, they move sediment around, they create the habitats that we see in the shoreline today. All those processes still are going on today. We may not think about them except during a big storm, but those are the processes that form our shoreline and continue to maintain our shorelines. Most of the sound is surrounded by coastal bluffs. These bluffs are features that have formed because of erosion over a very long period of time. Most of them are still eroding today, but they vary a great deal. Some of the bluffs are heavily vegetated. They don't erode very often. Other bluffs in other places may be high, steep, and may erode and may see landslides frequently. When erosion occurs, it often occurs as a landslide, maybe a very small one, just dumping a few wheelbarrowfuls of material down on the beach, or it may be a very large one that in some parts of the sound may even bring houses with it. But when that material comes down, it brings sand, it brings gravel, it brings mud, it brings trees, and the waves begin to work on that material, they move that material away. They move the fine grain, the silts and the clays, they move offshore into deep water. The big stuff, the boulders, may stay put and never get moved by the waves. But the sand and the gravel gets moved back and forth along the shoreline by the waves and eventually is what builds our beaches. Ironically, when we try to prevent erosion by building bulkheads and stabilizing bluffs, makes sense if you're a property owner concerned about a stairway or about your house, we cut off that supply of material from the bluffs to the beach. And over time, we have stretches of shoreline where we think we're losing the beaches because we've lost that natural supply of sediment. The beaches on the sound are made of sand and gravel that's been eroded from the bluffs or that's been delivered by streams. And probably the most characteristic thing about our beaches is that there's a mixture of sand and gravel. So whenever the waves come in on a high tide, they move that material around. They move it up the beach, they move it along the shoreline, and they'll move the sand and the gravel differently. So depending on the kind of storm or the stage of the tide, you may come out one day and find a beach that's largely sand, maybe a band of gravel along the upper edge of it. Other days you'll come out and the beach will look like it's all gravel. And that's characteristic of the change we see every time a storm comes in. We've seen how, as sand and gravel gets moved by wave action along the beach, it can move it from one place, an eroding bluff, for example, to some place quite different, maybe mile, miles away. In this case, we're sitting on a sand spit that's built across the mouth of a small stream. The spit itself is basically sort of a big pile of sand and gravel at the end of the conveyor belt, where that material has accumulated over a long period of time, and in this case, it's actually cut off the mouth of the stream or deflected the mouth of the stream, creating a small estuary. Here at the park, we have a great example of the relationship between the erosion of the bluffs and the formation and the maintenance of this spit. The erosion over time, over geologic periods, built this spit, but by the early 1970s, it had started to erode, and it looked like that erosion was largely because of bulkheading that had cut off the supply of material to the beach. That erosion was actually dealt with by coming back in and actually adding material, adding beach sediment back to the beach art artificially in order to maintain the spit, to keep it from breaching and affecting the estuary. The near shore is a, a quite extensive zone. It's starting way out at the edge of where light can penetrate until it's hitting the bottom of the water. And that's where light can, can uh, drive photosynthesis to allow things like algae and eelgrass to grow up from the bottom. And it's extending way up the hillside to the top of the bluff 
or in the case of where fresh water is entering uh, the shoreline, to the head of the tide, the head of the place where even the fresh water is going up and down with the tide. And the reason that's important is we're finding out as we study the nearshore processes that there's a lot of energy that's transferred between the water and the uplands and from the uplands on down to the beach. Um, there's a transfer of materials like wood, like leaves that form detritus. Uh, fresh water is coming down from the shoreline and the saltwater nutrients uh, from the critters that are being uh, eaten by crows and, and gulls and things like that are being carried up into the uplands and those nutrients are helping to support the trees there. So as we're looking at this zone of two very different communities between the freshwater dominated and, and uh, terrestrial environment and the marine environment of Puget Sound, uh, we're, we're trying to define this area where there's a lot of flow of materials and energy uh, between those two zones and we're calling that the near shore. Here I am high up on the beach, but I'm still sitting in a, a big puddle of water. And you may not be able to see this, but the water's flowing by me from the uphill to the downhill. An important thing about Puget Sound beaches is that they're always bleeding fresh water. And uh, all of the shoreline geology here that you heard Hugh Shipman talk about is uh, kind of stacking up fresh water in the uplands and allowing it to bleed out into the, the beaches. That, uh, mixing of the fresh water along the shallow water edge of the salt water is creating a lower salinity zone. The salinity is the amount of salt dissolved in the water. We call that mix of fresh and, and salt water brackish water. Brackish water conditions are really important for a lot of uh, animals living in the intertidal zone, especially uh, young salmon as they're migrating from fresh water to salt water. They need to hang out in these intermediate salinity zones so that they can make the transition to be a saltwater creature as an adult. Um, so I'm standing here, uh, sitting here, and, and actually being able to uh, taste the water. And it's, uh, it's not quite fresh. I wouldn't want to drink a big glass of it, but it's uh, considerably less salty than the water that's behind me in the bay. This upper intertidal area is a very important place biologically. The trees that are above us are obviously providing shade from their branches. As the wood falls down from the branches or from the trunks onto the beach, it's helping to create beach structure and that microclimate, the little places where fresh water and shade can be on the beach uh, that help certain things get established. And there's a lot of terrestrial insects that we don't even realize that drop off of the leaves onto the beach all the time. Uh, there's uh, some recent research about salmon migrating along the shoreline. Uh, we're finding a lot of terrestrial insects in their stomachs and that means it's very important to maintain um, a, a forested shoreline. Well, this may not look too appetizing to you and me, all these dead things are mixing together in this upper intertidal zone, uh, being uh, coated with algae, being coated with fungus, being torn down into smaller and smaller pieces that we call detritus. Now detritus is flowing out into Puget Sound and being processed by lots of other animals uh, throughout the year. And it's probably as important of a food source as the phytoplankton and the zooplankton that are occurring out in the oceanic parts of the sound. Um, a really important thing as we're standing in this high intertidal zone is the interaction between wood and the sediments of the beaches. There is a large western red cedar tree and it is leaning over onto the beach and will eventually fall onto the beach. This is a really important source of wood and it does a number of things. It uh, harbors lots of beach hoppers. As uh, you turn over a piece of wood you'll see uh, that moister, cooler environment where the beach hoppers can hang out and they're going to be taking the small piece of vegetation, the leaves and the algae and turning it into detritus. And the wood is also going to move around on the beach and create uh, small micro climate areas where other vegetation can take hold. So we're up here in the upper intertidal part of the beach and the sandy uh, consistency of this harbors a number of organisms that you don't see further down on the beach. For example, as I move um, algae off the beach, there's a number of little beach hoppers that are breaking this down into smaller particles. Those particles are sinking down into the sand and they're helping the sand to retain moisture. There's uh, several species of forage fish. The one that's going to use uh, sandy uh, soils like this for its spawning is the sand lance. And Pacific sand lance are going to come up here during a high tide. They're going to lay their eggs into the sand and those eggs will incubate into the wet sand for about two weeks while the, the water level stays below um, this area. The, the moisture that's retained by the, the small bits of algae is going to be a perfect uh, 
temperature and, and moisture for those eggs to incubate. In about two weeks, the high tide will come back to this level and the small fish will uh, emerge from their eggs and then go out into the water. Uh, sand lance are uh, particularly susceptible to any disruptions of this upper intertidal zone. So as people do uh, bulkheading along the shoreline and disrupt those natural sediment transport processes, this elevation and this slope and this particularly very narrow area for sand lance to spawn might disappear from the beach. Just a few feet above the beach uh, from where we were, the sandy substrate, we have a mix of sand and gravel. This kind of pea-sized gravel is a spawning bed for uh, the surf smelt. The surf smelt is a little bit larger fish than the sand lance. Uh, the surf smelt eggs are going to be sticky and they're going to stick in between the sand grains and kind of have um, uh, sand and, and gravel grains all around them. So the sand lance and the surf smelt, specifically the surf smelt, are up in this highest part of the intertidal beach, need the shade of overhanging trees and the leaves that are dropping in um, to be able to support their, their spawning conditions. Now, as these young forage fish, the sand lance and the surf smelt emerge, they're going to become a very important food source for migrating salmon that are going to be coming out of the rivers, moving along the shoreline looking for food, uh, ducking into these low salinity areas near, near streams, and they're going to be uh, feeding on forage fish juveniles. As those forage fish mature out into the sound, they'll become food for lots of other things too. As we're building along the shoreline, as we build bulkheads and we clear um, that native vegetation off the beach, we are reducing the amount of food, the amount of wood, and the amount of leaves for the detritus that, that uh, gets uh, ground up by these amphipods. Mudflats are more productive than people give them credit for. There's this uh, diatom film. It's a single-celled plant that is really taking advantage of the sunlight hitting this dark surface, and it's very warm and these single-celled plants can grow extremely fast and form a, a film, this kind of orangish brown film across the surface of the sand. It's a very important food source for all kinds of things that are living below the sand and over top of it. Um, for example, the clams will uh, bring in a suspension of both floating particles from the water column and they'll also kind of vacuum up the surface with their siphons as they um, get this film into their, their bodies and it's a good source of nourishment for them. Some of the neat things to do when you're along the beach is to turn over rocks and look at what's uh, growing on the undersides. A lot of times the uh, low tide is going to stress a lot of the animals on the beach and they're going to seek shade and water and there's usually water that's gathered in the uh, pockets underneath the rock but it's really important that after you've looked that you roll those rocks back to where you found them and cover them back up. These are green shore crabs. There's a couple different species of shore crabs that live uh, usually under rocks or around. Uh, they, they, the low tide usually has them hiding out so they can avoid the, the sun and the heat and the drying uh, conditions of low tide. Once the tide water comes back over top of them, they go out and forage and they'll eat uh, algae and they'll eat uh, little bits of uh, barnacles or whatever other uh, uh, dead meat might be lying around on the, the beach floor. Well, barnacles are a pretty common sight on uh, most beaches. Uh, barnacles will cement themselves when they're very young to uh, a large or a rock or even a small cobble. And the barnacles uh, will spawn en masse, uh, really uh, filling the water column with lots of uh, larvae, and it's a really important food source. Also, if you look at those uh, feeding tentacles, the little arms that are coming out of the barnacle gathering food, um, just like a, another crab or a shrimp, they have to uh, shed their shells in order to grow. I know it's really tempting when you're on the beach to pick up sand dollars, and I would say in Toby State Park and a lot of places like it, this is a million dollar beach. Uh, there's as many sand dollars as I've seen anywhere. It's very important when you're around uh, sand dollars to step lightly on the beach and be careful where you are because they're generally right underneath the sand only a few inches. If you find a live one like this, which is all covered with these brown spines and, and little hairs, that you place him back on the beach, right side up, just like that, and he'll bury himself back in. If you want to collect a souvenir, uh, there's plenty of dead sand dollars, usually looking uh, gray to white, various stages of uh, uh, completeness, and you might uh, want to take that home, rinse him with fresh water, and let him dry out in the sun. But otherwise, uh, please don't collect the 
live sand hours because they are living creatures and they do need to be back here in the sand to survive. This little gelatinous mass here is a uh, group of sculpin eggs. There's several species of sculpins. They live in the intertidal zone and they will get together and breed and lay these egg masses. It'll take a few weeks for the eggs to hatch out and then the young will uh, find their way into the sand to hide out until they're large enough to fend for themselves. Well, a lot of times you'll also see on the beach these little volcanoes with uh, holes in the middle. It's kind of hard to tell whether you're going to find a clam in there or a uh, sand shrimp or mud shrimp, but uh, we'll dig into this one and see what we find. Now, just like I said with the sand dollars, it's really important anytime you dig a hole in the beach to replace the uh, sand kind of the way you found it, and that way um, anything that might have been displaced by your digging will, will not be hurt. Here's a young bent nose clam. They start out um, without a bent nose, but as they get larger, the top shell where the siphon comes out begins to bend to one, to one direction. And here's the shell of a cockle. It's another bivalve, another small clam that uh, can actually get up to about that size, um, maybe weigh a half a pound or more. And uh, you'll often find cockles used uh, to make uh, clam chowder along with some of the larger clams like uh, horse clams and gooey ducks. There's a number of worms that will dig into the sand and they'll use a mucus that they secrete and they'll use the smallest sand and mud grains to uh, cement them together into a tube. And that tube becomes their home. So you can see this worm tube that went a uh, good six inches down into the sediment, but the worm doesn't seem to be home, or he's dug himself out of the way. The worm is a really important food source for a lot of the migrating shorebirds. We've seen some yellow legs here on the beach and some other uh, sanderlings and things like that are going to move across the shore. They're going to find these tubes and they're going to rip the whole thing out much faster than I could and they'll be able to tear the tube open and get the worm out. This is the shed exoskeleton of a Dungeness crab. Uh, Dungeness crab will come into shallow areas like this and use the osmotic pressure of the fresh water to help um, break their shells open. This is a horsehair crab and the shell will stay soft for the next uh, 24 hours or so. While it uh, hardens up they'll hide or bury into the sand and then they'll um, kind of grow into the next one inside. One of the more common uh, marine algaes in the intertidal zone is sea lettuce and I call it sea lettuce because it's actually pretty tasty. Um, uh, it's a little on the salty side but a lot of folks will uh, dry it and put it on salads. Uh, it's uh, packed full of vitamins. If you uh, got hungry on the beach and needed to survive, this will carry you for at least a day or two. This is uh, lava, and this is one of the main ingredients in sushi. So all of these uh, communities are connected, and they're happening right at this place at the highest tide line, um, where the interaction of the, the terrestrial environment and the marine environment are producing a really unique and special place. Today, we're out to take a look at some of the shorelines of Thurston County and some of the development that's taking place along our shorelines. What people need to consider when they're buying a piece of waterfront property or developing a piece of waterfront property is these sites are semi-unstable because of the existing geology. To remove the existing vegetation and plant a lawn, for instance, has a significant impact in terms of the stability of the top of that bluff. When people do this, oftentimes what they'll find is a portion of their property breaking up at the top and dropping down at the bottom. You'll get slide events that you wouldn't normally see on adjacent pieces of property. While grass is attractive, it does provide problems for marine bluff property owners. Uh, one of the problems is oversaturation, that it does require a certain amount of water to stay green. This can also add a lot of water into the soils, which could cause problems later on. The other thing is that people sometimes use chemical fertilizers on their lawns. Those can then run off, and that becomes a non-point source of pollution to the Puget Sound. We chose not to have a lawn because we enjoy the plants that bring in the wildlife, and it also keeps us from having to pay for the maintenance of a lawn and the chemicals, and gives us more time to enjoy the water. I think it's really important for me to make sure that I keep clean up after my pup's waste and I always carry plastic bags because the fecal coliform 
There's so many of us living here now, it's really important to clean up after our pets. One dog makes a big difference, and I can't just say, oh, well, you know, one time doesn't matter, because it does matter. Everything matters. It's important to leave as much of the native vegetation in place and to site your home back far enough so that it's not in peril. We believe that area to be located behind the two-to-one slope of the Marine Bluff and even further back is actually safer. Oftentimes, by moving it further back, you gain some elevation and you also gain some view. Now, the native vegetation is very important. The roots grow well on these soils. They hold the soils together and they're also drought tolerant since they've always been there. They're not going to be something that's going to require a great deal of maintenance. The other important thing is the amount of transpiration and the amount of water that they take up and take out is important in terms of maintaining the stability of the geology on the site. So it's important to leave as much of the native vegetation as possible. It's important to us when we build our house to build it far back from the beach and leave the trees intact. We even have a tree in the deck. The trees are more than just protection in the winter and the summer. They help stabilize the bank. They help the water retention, they help filter out the water and clean it, and the trees provide a lot of the insects for the animals or the fish that live in the water. Also, the trees are a view for us. They're beautiful. They dance in the wind and they bring us harmony and each tree has its own personality. We love to go down to the beach and look at a view of the, of the Olympics, but the trees are part of this place and make it special. The other plant we see people using on waterfront property is English ivy. It's an invasive species. Not only does it take over areas, it also kills all the native species. So we'll see large trees being taken over by the English ivy and eventually dying. It also hides problems. Once the plant is in place, you don't really know what's going on underneath it. If there's cracking of the soil somewhere that might indicate some, some future slide activity, it will not be visible to the property owner. In several cases, I've seen uh, hillsides of English ivy drop down to the beach because of the weight and the shallowness of the root system within the uh, ivy. If you've got English ivy, you need to remove it in manageable sections and replant with erosion control native plants that are more suitable to the site. It's important to prevent surface erosion by mulching the bare ground until the new plants are established. This used to be total ivy, and if I didn't know about ivy, um, it probably would take over, it would climb up these trees, it would go everywhere. And the thing about ivy is it becomes a monoculture and just takes over all the native plants. The local weed control specialist can help you get rid of ivy, but this is what I did in my, in my situation. First of all, I got rid of the ivy by removing it from the trees. I just cut off the base, and then I went to the ground level, and I just started pulling out rolling it back and pulling it out and some of it was really deep so I had to really rip out the roots and that was um, a little bit harder but it was a good exercise and gave me more muscle strength and it made me feel good to know that I'm helping the native plants in this area thrive. It's important to get the ivy totally out. I think once you get the hang of it it's kind of fun. After we took the ivy out, it was important that we put something back in so that the ivy didn't come right back. So we planted um, native plants and they provide food for the wildlife and they also help stabilize the bank. And it's just wonderful watching the four seasons with the hummingbirds feeding off the current and the salmonberry and enjoying the native plants that belong here. People believe that the bulkhead will protect their marine bluff from a landslide. However, the bulkhead will not protect the upper bluff. It only protects the erosion at the toe. The upper bluff is still subject to a slide event, and this is often precipitated by the removal of vegetation and poor drainage methods on the property. Additional erosion could occur because of a wind, freeze thaw, and oversaturation of soils caused from the development itself on the upper part of the bluff. When the slide occurs, it either just takes out the bulkhead by pushing it forward onto the beach and burying it or just overtopping the structure that's at the toe of the slope. People see a greater amount of erosion occurring adjacent to a concrete bulkhead. This occurs when you get the energy reflecting off the concrete structure and then down on the beach. Not only does it erode in front of the bulkhead, but it also erodes the adjacent property as well. Then the adjacent property owner is in with an application for a concrete bulkhead indicating that they have erosion now that they didn't have before because of the structure and they need something to protect their toe and so on and so on in somewhat of a domino effect. The use of an alternative method of 
tow protection using root wads or other large woody debris with some rock helps provide a habitat for the upper intertidal area as well as our deflecting energy away from the toe of the slope and in the meantime the bluff has been able to provide sediment to the beach so that the beaches can be maintained in a natural state. We see a lot of erosion and some slide activity occurring primarily in areas where people have not protected their upland properties by using some sort of stormwater drainage devices such as a, a tight line or a way of transferring the water from the built environment down to the beach successfully. Typically the tight line will transfer the water from um, the roof drains as well as where there's an impervious surface that the water will then go into the drains and then be conveyed to the beach. If not correctly installed, these lines can cause more problems for the upland property as far as slide activities. In the past we've seen slide events occur where the tight line breaks because of the type of material used, in which case now they have a very nervous homeowner who's located precariously on top of a marine bluff where the house was was 50 feet from the top of the bluff, it's now 20 feet from the top of the bluff. Once water has been placed into a tight line that can move quite fast through the line down to the beach, that's why it's important to have a dissipator at the end. Oftentimes this can be like a wire mesh bag full of rocks or can be some more organic method using woody debris and rocks together. It's important to dissipate the water to avoid the scouring away of sediments at the upper tidal zone that forage fish depend upon. People want access to the shoreline. We prefer that property owners work together or create a common access in a location that has the least amount of impact along the shoreline. Problems associated with shoreline access are large stair structures having to be constructed, requiring the removal of a lot of native vegetation and possibly adding to the instability of the marine bluff. By creating a shared access at maybe the lowest point along the shoreline, they can provide a multiple usage of one stairway as opposed to say four or five and that reduces both the cost and the maintenance for all the property owners who use that access. People who will have waterfront property oftentimes think they need a bulkhead to create a landing to get to the beach. One can easily place a structure at the toe of the bluff without having to have any type of bulkhead whatsoever to uh, gain access to the beach. I can come home from a busy day and it's just um, so refreshing to hear the eagles and see the loons and grebes and, and the canopy and not have to worry about pruning or my bulkhead, but letting things just naturally take their place and just watch what happens. It's, it's, a, it's just a blessing. Maintaining trees along shorelines is critically important to protecting property. The trees' canopies intercept rainfall and their roots remove water from the soil and transpire it back to the atmosphere. The roots also keep many layers of soil in place. All of these factors increase the stability of slopes with trees on them. Trees such as these have interconnectivity with their canopies and root systems. So when people cut down all their trees except one, that remaining tree has lost its support network and is much more likely to blow down in the next big windstorm. It's best to leave clusters of trees as they appear in nature and to address any problems using pruning techniques. People usually top a tree because they want to open a view or because they're worried about the tree being dangerous. But topping is not the solution and can actually exacerbate the situations people are trying to improve. If a tree really is hazardous, then it should be removed or pruned by an arborist. Topping will just create an entry point for disease and hasten a tree's death, making it more of a hazard. Or the topping will encourage the tree to produce a bunch of weak branches, which can be very dangerous. If the tree isn't actually a hazard, but the residents want more peace of mind, selective pruning techniques can be used to remove poorly attached branches or reduce the tree's wind sail potential. If you want to open a view, there are several pruning techniques an International Society of Arboriculture certified arborist can use. Topping can actually cause more obstructions of your view because the tree will try to replace its lost canopy with vigorous new growth right below the topping wound. And in fact, this growth will actually be bushier than what was there in the first place. Let's look at some types of selective pruning that can open views and reduce wind sail. Behind me we have um, very good examples of crown raising 
or skirting. This is where they actually remove the lower portion of the canopy of the tree and it works very well opening up a view past the trunk um, to whatever the focus is behind that. Crown raising or skirting can be applied to younger trees. You remove the lower portion of the canopy to redirect energy into the upper portion of the canopy to allow the tree to grow faster and eventually move up out of your view. Window pruning is basically taking out a small section of the tree's canopy to open up a specific view. Generally, whether you're windowing or doing some of the other view prunings, you do not want to take more than 25% of the canopy off the tree in one growing season. The drones are broadleafed evergreen trees that are especially important along shorelines. They are salt tolerant and their evergreen canopies can capture rainwater in winter. Plus they have a deep widespread root system that is so strong it can actually penetrate hardpan. So madrones help to remove water from slopes which can prevent deep seated erosion and slides. Some people are often worried that madrones are a hazard tree because of their tendency to grow out from a slope at an angle or even almost horizontally. But that's just growth habit and it's nothing to worry about. You rarely see a madrone that's pulled out of a marine bluff and in fact their roots are so deep that even a dead madrone will still provide stability to a bank for many years. Many of the madrones along our marine bluffs are suffering from various canker or viral infections. This can be treated by a climbing arborists. They can actually prune out some of that dead wood and enhance the health and uh, structure of that tree. But if you have a very healthy madrone, I would not really recommend pruning any of the branches off of that that could in fact actually invite disease or an infection through that pruning cut or that open wound. If you do have a question about whether a tree should be removed or the proper pruning techniques for your situation, contact an ISA certified arborist to come out and take a look at your trees, assess them, and recommend a prescription for any trees needing work. Many times, people try to take trees out themselves or rely on someone who has some equipment. Tree removal and pruning is dangerous, and it may not be necessary. So always get advice from an expert. I can make a difference in my own yard by gaining knowledge, helping nature be what it's intended to be here, which will provide nutrients and a healthy ecosystem for all that lives here. And that, what more can you ask for in life? Thank you.